Okay, hello and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, servicing a global membership of computing professionals and students. I am Alexey Efros, Professor of Computer Science at UC Berkeley. My research is in the area of computer vision and computer graphics, especially at the intersection of the two. I'm particularly interested in using data-driven techniques to tackle problems where large quantities of unlabeled data are easily available. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with ACM, uh, what is it and uh, 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 or what is it has to offer? Here is uh, some information. ACM offers educational professional development uh, resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM provides access to ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, leading publications and global conferences that draw top experts on broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teaching training, and ACM Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Awards, um, and the ACM Code of Ethics, a collection of principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in uh, professional practice. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on this slide in front of you. You have, uh, if you have questions at any time, please type them in using Zoom's Q&A button. You will, will organize the questions and Mani, uh, as Manish speaks, and then we will try to get to as many of them as possible at the end. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an email notification when it becomes available. And check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other uh, upcoming seminars. At the end of the presentations, we will see a, you will see a quick survey uh, open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out and improve our tech talk. Okay, today's presentation is uh, uh, by Manish Agrawala. Manish Agrawala is a Forest ba Basket uh, Professor of Computer Science and Director of the Brown Institute for Media Innovation at Stanford University. Uh, he works on computer graphics, the human-computer interaction, and visualization. His focus is on investigating how cognitive design principles can be used to improve the effectiveness of audiovisual media. The goals of this work uh, are to discover the design principles and then instantiate them in both interactive and automated design tools. His honors include the Akava Foundation Research Grant, uh, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship, ACL Career Award, SIGGRAPH Significant New Research Award, the MacArthur Found, uh, Foundation Fellowship, the so-called Genius Grant, uh, Allen Distinguished Investigator Award, and the induction into the Kai, uh, Sig Kai Academy. He was named ACM Fellow in 2022. Uh, I would like to also mention personally that Manish has been a, a lifelong inspiration to me. Uh, his work has always been extremely creative and out of the box. And, uh, and I'm sure you have also uh, come in contact with it if you have seen some of the recent results based on Manish's work on uh, uh, ControlNet. Uh, you might not know that's, that's, that is that is control net, but when you see some amazing results on Twitter, chances are this is part of Manish's work. Okay, uh, without further ado, uh, Manish, please take it away. Great, thank you so much for the introduction, Alyosha. Um, uh, let me get this uh, onto the screen. Is that uh, showing up correctly? Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, yeah, so uh, you know, I've been thinking about AI for a while now, and in particular, how we might design useful interfaces for AI. And so that's what I really wanna talk about today. And uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, with you through the ACM. Uh, and uh, also thank you to Alyosha for serving as the moderator uh, for this talk. It's great that uh, we can we can do this together. Um, so let's start with this. What is this? Well, it's a black box. And modern AI, especially generative AI tools, 
are essentially black boxes. They are tools that take some input and somehow magically transmute it into some output. Now, in this case, the box represents DALI, a text to image model, but it could just as well represent GPT-4, ChatGPT, Stable Diffusion, MidJourney, or really any deep neural network. So I've been wanting for a while now to update the profile picture on my web page. And I thought with the advent of DALI, maybe I could use DALI to do the update. And so I gave it the following prompt, and this is the result that it produced. Now, at many levels, I think this image is absolutely astounding. DALI was able to take a text prompt as input and make a coherent image out of it. It figured out probably from the name that it should produce someone who looks like they're of Indian origin. It figured out how to dress the person in professorly attire. It placed the person in a conference room. Uh, all the components of the image, the lighting, the shading, the texture of the cloth and the tables and so on, all of it works as a single unified image. And this really is amazing. Now, uh, there are some artifacts. Uh, I won't quibble about them. The fingers don't look quite right on the hand. Uh, one temple of the glasses is missing. Uh, in fact, the lenses are a little bit asymmetric if you look closely. Um, and I was really hoping that Dali would make someone that looked a little cooler and younger than this person. Um, Nevertheless, what I think is truly amazing about this is that we can now generate really high quality photorealistic images as quickly as we can think of a text prompt. And this is a brand new capability. It's one that we as humans haven't really had before. So I think this is very exciting. Uh, by the way, Alyosha, uh, not that you need it I think your web page is fine, but because it's so easy to create these images, I decided to have Dali make a portrait of you as well. Uh, and uh, I have to say that I think this is much cooler and more distinguished looking than mine. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so this is this is a really cool capability. Now, um, now let's use Dali to construct another image. In this case, I want to take the main quad at Stanford, including Memorial Church as shown here. This is a photograph, this is a real photograph, it wasn't generated. But I wanna construct an image that is of the main quad at Stanford with the church and render it in the style of the film Blade Runner. And when I think of the film Blade Runner, what I really think of is nighttime, rain, uh, food stalls, neon signs all over the place, the kind of grittiness of uh, downtown Tokyo. And, um, and really I think of things like this. So on the left is a film still from the movie Blade Runner. On the right is a real photograph of Tokyo titled Neo Dystopian Tokyo Blade Runner style. So a photographer was able to take this photograph and make it look like he imagined the style of Blade Runner. And so all of this is to say is that there is a kind of style to a Blade Runner. And what I wanna do is take the Memorial Church uh, that we saw earlier and the quad and render it in this style. So just take a moment to imagine this image in Blade Runner style. That's what I wanna produce. Okay, so here we go. I start with this first prompt, Stanford Memorial Church with neon signage in the style of Blade Runner. And the result I get, well, it has the neon, it has the kind of nighttime, but all I really see is this building. I don't really see the quad. I can't see the palm trees in the quad. I can't see um, the rain and the grittiness. So I, uh, I go a few iterations later, I add main quad with palm trees. Uh, we now see those things, but it's not really rainy. Uh, there aren't any food stalls. It's not really gritty. Um, I do a few more iterations. I add nighttime rain, night market food stalls, and neon signs. 
Um, we get the rainy reflections on the ground. Uh, we don't really see the rain. It's hard to see the food stalls. Uh, it's not quite in the style that I imagine. So I continue to work on this. I add more uh, iterations, more changes to the prompt. I, at iteration 17, I add uh, in the, in, to look like downtown Tokyo. I get this. We can start to see some food stalls. We don't see a lot of neon. Uh, it's still not really in the style that I want. It doesn't have the grittiness. It's maybe a bit too photorealistic. So a few more iterations. I ask for an illustration and uh, I arrive at this at iteration 21. And to me, this isn't really what I had in mind. <laughs> right? It's, uh, you know, it maybe reflects some of the things in my prompt, but it isn't an image of the Stanford main quad in the, st in the style of Blade Runner. Uh, and I don't think it's great. And this took hours to create of just trying different prompts. It was essentially randomly trying different prompts. It felt fairly random. And to me, this kind of trial and error prompting is a terrible interface. And what's worse about it is that I don't know how to make this image better. I don't know how to change the prompt to push it more in the direction of the image that I have in my head of what the quad should look like in the Blade Runner style. I'm essentially randomly guessing prompts. And, um, you know, prompt engineering is considered so difficult that there are websites like PromptBase, as shown here, that will sell you good prompts or prompt templates. And um, of course, there are multiple research papers, really a ton of research papers, that focus on prompt engineering. Now, to me, sometimes prompt engineering can feel a little bit like randomly hacking. Someone uh, was hunting for a while to find a kind of natural language prompt that would do something useful. Uh, they found it and the resulting prompt template essentially is what is called prompt engineering. And it, it's, it's useful to figure out the capabilities of these models, but there's something that uh, doesn't feel great about this. And so, um, you know, we wanted to think a little bit about what the trouble is with prompt engineering and really prompting in general. So why is prompt engineering so difficult? And I think the key issue has to do with the user's conceptual model when they are developing a prompt. Um, and to explain this, I wanna to turn to an example, an anecdote from Don Norman's classic book, the design of everyday things. Uh, and this is really a, a great book if you're interested in interfaces and I highly recommend it if you haven't read it. Now, Norman has this story in the book where he talks about a two compartment refrigerator he used to own. It had a freezer compartment at the top and a fresh food compartment at the bottom, something like this. And he had trouble setting the temperature of the two compartments properly. Um, and uh, the way he had to, you know, the controls he had for setting the temperatures looked something like this. So there was a control for the freezer and there was a separate control for the fresh food compartment. And no matter how he adjusted these controls, one would be too hot and the other would be too cold. And he ended up having to try out lots of different combinations of these settings and had trouble getting it right. Now, the issue was really Norman's conceptual model of how these controls adjusted temperature. Like many of us, he assumed that each control operated an independent cooling unit. The controls independently adjusted the temperature, one for the freezer, one for the fresh food compartment. And it turns out that this conceptual model is wrong. The true system model is shown here. There's one cooling unit and one control on the cooling unit uh, adjusting how much cold air is coming out. And the second control uh, controls this valve that directs the 
cold air either to the fresh food compartment or to the, to the freezer. And so the controls are coupled and they're not independent of one another as Norman thought. He had the wrong conceptual model. And the point here is that his incorrect conceptual model made it very difficult to predict how settings on these two controls would produce the output temperature. And he ended up having to resort to trial and error, which is, of course, very, very frustrating. In his case, it was especially frustrating because uh, it took 24 hours for the temperature to stabilize in the two compartments. So every time he adjusted the, the controls, he would have to wait 24 hours to see if he got the right thing. So, uh, but overall, this is this is very, very bad. <laughs> it, 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 you end up having to do trial and error. And so I argue that well-designed interfaces let users build a conceptual model that can predict how input controls affect the output results. When the conceptual model is not predictive, predictive or non-existent, interfaces require trial and error. Now, I should emphasize that the conceptual model doesn't have to exactly match the true system model, but rather it needs to be predictive. It needs to predict how settings of the controls will affect the outputs. And moreover, I think it is our job as AI tool builders to really provide interfaces that let users build this kind of predictive conceptual model to predict the mappings from the input controls to the outputs. So going back to Dali and the prompting, uh, you know, I argue that today's black boxes, black box AIs are really unpredictable. It's unclear how a natural language prompt like this one, where I try to get a cooler and younger looking image, um, uh, maps to the output results. How does this, uh, you know, result relate to cool and young? Is the sports coat cool? Are the glasses cool? The moosed up hair? What part of the prompt is related to what parts of the image? Image that is very, very unclear. And similarly for young, how do we uh, relate the image to the prompt word young? That is also very, very unclear. And in general, I just can't predict how changing the prompt will change the image. And so I have to go back and, and, and go to trial and error as I, show, as I showed earlier with the, with the Blade Runner example. And what I claim is that this will always be a problem. We will always have to rely on trial and error as long as we don't have a reasonable predictive model uh, for how the inputs affect the outputs. Now, you might argue that one goal of AI tools is to be indistinguishable from humans, right? That's uh, what we're aiming for with the Turing test and, and other things. And well, isn't this natural language prompts, uh, aren't they the way that we would interact with humans if we were working together with another human to do something? And humans are great interfaces, aren't they? Well, I want to argue that humans are also not great interfaces. They're terrible in the same ways that AI is terrible. We don't have really great predictive models of what another person will do given a text prompt. That said, our conceptual models of humans are better than our conceptual models of AI tools. So uh, in particular, I can work with another human and have a conversation with them to help, uh, uh, to help make the, the task <laughs> happen in the way that I want it to happen. And uh, psycholinguists like Herb Clark and others have studied how humans use turn-taking conversation to establish common ground, shared semantics, for the words, the natural language words that we use in the prompt, and how we can use mechanisms for repair when it is clear that there are misunderstandings. 
So the turn-taking conversation can help refine what it what we want to produce. And so here I asked for a picture of a cool and young computer science professor. The artist, the human artist, asked me back, well, you know, how should we uh, define the term cool? Should we define it as having him wear a sports coat or a hoodie, right? And then I can respond something in between. And together through the conversation, we can establish a shared semantics for what the word cool means. And uh, we can end up with an illustration like this one that is maybe closer to what I had in mind uh, when I asked for this picture. Now, beyond the conversational interactions, we also have a pretty strong prior for the conceptual model of another human that we're working with based on a model of ourselves. I think we have a prior that suggests the other person will do something akin to what we would do if we were in their position. Now, so, so this kind of conceptual model is better than the one that we have for AI. And uh, this allows us to reduce the amount of trial and error necessary when we're working with another human to accomplish some task. But some amount of turn taking back and forth is still required. And so it's not perfect, but it's way better than working with a black box AI. With AI today, there's, well, I shouldn't say no conversation, but there's very little conversation. Um, there's little buildup of common ground. And we'll talk about this more in a moment. Um, there's little, there, there are a few mechanisms to repair and fix ambiguities and misunderstandings. And what's worse, I think, is that the conceptual model that we have for how these AI models work is either non-existent or worse, it is incorrect. It is based on a model of ourselves. We tend to anthropomorphize these uh, black box AI models. We treat them often as other humans and we assume, we fall back on the assumption that they will produce what another human would produce in the same situation. And uh, it's almost certainly the case that these models don't work the way another human works. And so this ends up leading to lots and lots of trial and error. So how can we, how can we start to address these problems? And one thing I think we can do is to build uh, AI interfaces that are more conversational in the ways that humans converse with one another. And already we can see tools like ChatGPT moving in this direction. So uh, in this example, I decided to do the modern equivalent of ego surfing. And I asked ChatGPT this question. And here's how it responded. So it gives us three professors that it thinks are smart, Stephen Hawking, Noam Chomsky, and Terence Tao. And these three make a lot of sense. Uh, I was a little sad that I didn't make the list, but uh, I think these are totally reasonable choices. I think what's interesting here is that I asked a very imprecise question. Smart can mean all kinds of things. And in fact, ChatGPT points this out in its reply. It says that determining the smartest professor is subjective and depends on the criteria used to measure intelligence. Intelligence can manifest in various forms, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it, it, it tells me back that smart can mean a lot of things, but ChatGPT doesn't ask me to refine the question. It simply gives me three answers and it chooses to define smart as people known for their uh, contributions to their respective fields. So I decide to continue the conversation <laughs> and in the next exchange, I decide to refine the question and I explicitly limit the term smartest to people in computer graphics. And uh, for Alyosha's sake, I decide to include computer vision as well. Um, and really what I'm doing here is trying to 
provide better shared semantics, a definition for the word smart, and also hopefully point ChatGPT in my direction a little bit. Now, here's what we get. And it produces a list of five people that work in computer graphics and computer vision that are definitely very smart. Um, they're all academics in a way, though they're not all necessarily professors. Um, and of course, unfortunately, I still didn't rate highly enough to make chat, chat GPT's list. And neither, unfortunately, did Alyosha. I was pretty sure he would be on this list, but um, I don't know what happened. So, uh, so let's refine this list, uh, this question further, right? I want to refine it to focus on the Bay Area, and hopefully this time it'll do the trick. But when I asked ChatGPT this question as the third exchange, unfortunately, ChatGPT forgets the definition of smartest that we established earlier. It doesn't focus on computer graphics and computer vision or even on professors. It gives us people that are notable, notable figures. Uh, and so the shared understanding, the common ground the, that we tried to establish, it somehow was forgotten. Now, it turns out I went back and replaced this third exchange with lots of other prompts to see if I could get it to remember what I was saying earlier as the definition of uh, smartest. And, uh, and if I go back and replace this third exchange with the following prompt, uh, I, I, it can re remember my definition. And when I run this, it now goes back to producing a list of academics and professors in the Bay Area that are smartest in uh, computer graphics and computer vision. But the point here is that I, as a user, have to figure out the prompt that can lead to the proper uh, meaning for the word smartest. Right? I had to go back and try lots of different prompts in this third exchange to get ChatGPT to remember what I meant. And in a way, we're back to trial and error. So this kind of conversational establishment of common ground, in this case, I think it's being done through the context window of the, the AI, um, it, it, it's not perfect. And I think still has a number of issues that need to be worked out. So what we've seen is that ChatGPT is starting to be conversational. Um, users and the AI can refer to previous concepts within the context window to refine them to some extent, but the refinement is somewhat one-sided. The AI doesn't ask for the refinement. I, as the human user, need to think about how to provide it, right? And uh, importantly, the AI model doesn't learn from our conversations. It doesn't update or fine tune the weights inside of the model. It just relies on having this context window. And so, uh, so that may be an issue as well. <laughs> it can't, it, it doesn't immediately update uh, based on what it sees in our conversation. And you might argue that maybe it shouldn't update, but um, or it should have lots of conversations before it updates. But I think uh, there's, uh, you know, it, it doesn't update the way a human partner would update uh, if we were talking and conversing. Um, the biggest issue I would argue, though, is that the grounding seems somewhat shallow. It's unclear how much kind of common sense knowledge is in these systems. And it's, it's unclear as a user what ChatGPT knows and it doesn't know, uh, and it doesn't know, and, and we don't know what it'll work, what it will remember from previous exchanges. And so the conversation still can require multiple turns to establish basic shared facts. Now, in the domain of text to image 
generation, uh, which is closer to the areas that I work on, um, I think of a tool like Dream Booth and uh, the related work on textual in inversion as good examples of tools for establishing common ground. So the way Dream Booth works, uh, it's an add-on to stable diffusion or these text to image diffusion models. And you give it a few examples of what you mean by a particular concept. So here I give it a few examples of this uh, Chihuahua and Dream Booth fine tunes the weights of the underlying AI model uh, to learn what I mean by this dog so that it can stick the dog into new scenes. It can generate new scenes with the dog uh, inside of them. And so uh, what we've done here really with Dream Booth is uh, we now have a tool that will allow us to tell Dream Booth what we mean by a particular concept by giving it examples of that concept. And so that's a really nice way to establish this, this kind of common ground. Um, prompt to prompt editing uh, is a, another uh, paper, uh, not, not our work, but uh, colleagues uh, in Israel. And uh, this to me is about repair. So here uh, I can provide an initial prompt. Uh, the boulevards are crowded today. And, uh, and then realize that maybe my text prompt wasn't exactly what I wanted. I didn't want it to be crowded. And so I can go back and repair the prompt. I can remove the word crowded and generate a new image that maintains the overall structure of the image. It just removes the people for the most part, right? So there's a lot of shared structure that is retained before and after the, the change. And I've just made a kind of, uh, in some sense, a local kind of repair. And, uh, and we see this in, in a number of examples here. Now, another issue with uh, these kinds of natural language uh, AI tools is that there is a lot of ambiguity in natural language. Um, and so as an example of this, uh, I want to think about this image. It was generated using stable diffusion. And what I want you to think about is the text prompt that generated this image. What might that have been? All right. The true prompt is this. And I suspect that almost none of you we're thinking of this, right? Many of the best images that are generated with text to image diffusion models today, they have these really long prompts like this one. But I wanna draw your attention to the actual words in the prompt, at least at the beginning. Uh, the prompt asks for a full body. We're able to get that. It asks for a walking pose. I wouldn't really call this a walking pose. It asks for a female Spider-Man. I don't think this is a female. Uh, full body uh, armor, light silver armor. It's not really light silver. So the system, in this case, stable diffusion, has followed some of the prompt. It hasn't followed the entire prompt. And in particular, um, the prompt is very ambiguous about a number of things. We tell it the full body, but we don't tell it and we tell it walking pose, but um, walking pose can be interpreted in lots of ways. I wouldn't call this walking, but maybe that's the interpretation that, uh, that stable diffusion has. And so one problem with this kind of prompting is that the prompt provides very little spatial control over the composition and pose of the image. We can't very finely control the pose of the character. We can't say what should be in the upper left corner of this image versus the bottom right corner. Uh, we can't place the Spider-Man within the image very precisely. Now, the other problem with this kind of prompting is that if I change any word 
in the prompt, I get a completely new image. So I don't retain a lot of the structure of the underlying imagery. So here I change walking pose to swinging pose and I get a completely new image. What I really wanted was I wanted to have maybe the arm, the back arm of Spider-Man have a little, you know, uh, swinging from a uh, piece of web um, and make this a much more dynamic pose. But uh, when I, when I, replace walking pose with swinging pose, I get this, he's still not really swinging, uh, but the image is also completely different than the previous one. So trial and error is partly difficult because everything changes in the image, and that's not great. Small changes to the prompt completely change the image composition. So earlier this year, uh, uh, as Alyosha alluded to, uh, we really, my graduate student, Lumen Zhang, developed ControlNet to address some of these spatial control issues. And the idea of ControlNet is to use imagery as conditioning, in addition to a text prompt, if you want, to spatially constrain the images produced by a text to image diffusion model. And so here, in this case, we're using uh, an uh, an edge map, canny edges, on the left as the controls. And when we feed this to control net with stable diffusion, uh, we can generate these uh, high quality images as a result that closely adhere to the edges in the edge images. And um, we can further go beyond this and add in a text prompt and so while the edges are controlling locally what's happening in the image, the text prompt can further control the, uh, the global aspects of the image. So here we can explicitly ask for a man with a beard with two children, here a man in a suit and tie, but we can change the prompt and ask for a mother with two boys uh, and it adjusts the image to meet that kind of global constraint imposed by the, by the prompt but also uh, maintain the local constraints, the spatially localized composition imposed by the edges. So the composition is locked in and the prompt can have much more incremental effects. And uh, as a quick aside, I'll, I'll briefly touch on how ControlNet works. So as I mentioned before, it's an add-on to uh, stable diffusion. And uh, here, what we're illustrating is, uh, is uh, essentially one network block inside of stable diffusion. So uh, stable diffusion, as I mentioned, is a very large pre-trained text-to-image diffusion model. It was trained on something like uh, 5 billion images and uh, used 600,000 GPU hours of time to train. Uh, so it's very general uh, and very good. It produces high quality images, but um, it's difficult to control. All you have is a text prompt to control it. We wanted to build ControlNet to help you uh, control that better. And so here, uh, you, the way uh, these kinds of diffusion models work is that there's a noisy image X, it's fed to the model. Here I'm illustrating one block of the model, but you can think of this as a, as a unit with multiple blocks inside of it. And at the end of all of those blocks, with stable diffusion, you end up with a denoising vector Y that you add back to your image to, re, to, to remove the noise. Now, uh, and you do this over multiple iterations to get a clean image, a denoised image. And, and the way it works is that you can start with complete noise and end up with an image. So, uh, so that's stable diffusion. The way control networks is that we add on this uh, uh, modification to stable diffusion. We take uh, each of the blocks, as I'll show you in the encoding network of the unit. And we lock their weights and keep those as the original path of stable diffusion. And we add in a trainable copy of the blocks. So we just uh, uh, 
set this new trainable copy to the original weights of the pre-trained model. And we attach the uh, trainable copy to the original model using the so-called so zero convolution layers. And uh, the weights and biases of the zero convolution layers are uh, initialized to zero. So the conditioning image C comes in here at the top. Uh, we uh, uh, also continue to have the noisy image and together we pass these back to form the, the, the denoising vector. And uh, the key thing I think are really these, these zero convolution layers. The architecture is designed so that um, when these layers are initialized to zero, they enable progressively growing the, the weights during training inside the trainable copy. So if we directly fine tuned the original stable diffusion network, uh, we would, in the initial phases of the fine tuning, we could destroy some of the, the, the nice properties of stable diffusion. Fine tuning can be very, very difficult when you're directly fine tuning a network and the zero convolutions really allow the fine tuning to happen progressively. So, uh, so that's the basic architecture. Um, I've shown it to you on a single block. Here's what it actually looks like in practice. We have the stable diffusion unit here in gray the lock copy, and it's just the encoder blocks that we copy over to have the uh, trainable copy, and then we have the zero convolutions that are attaching in pack, right? And it turns out that this architecture, because I think of the zero convolutions, is, uh, is really able to retain the high quality imagery of stable diffusion, and it's fairly resource efficient to train and fine tune. Um, and just to, to show you that's the case, here's an example. Um, so here is an input control image edges for this lion. And with just 1,000 paired samples between edges and, um, and training images, like full, full photorealistic images, we're able to already produce something that is that looks a lot like a lion with 10K training pairs. Uh, it's looking even closer. And at 50K training pairs, we get something that looks pretty good. And all of this is to say that instead of having 50 billion, or sorry, 5 billion training images, we can get something that works fairly well with 50,000 uh, training pairs and is t uh, trained in about 600 GPU hours rather than 150,000. So uh, getting back to AI interfaces, um, you know, another way that I think we can improve these interfaces is by enabling iterative refinement instead of iterative trial and error. So um, creating content like in this case where an artist is manually sketching and drawing, typically involves iteratively refining an image towards a goal. And in this case, it goes by fairly quickly, but notice how the artist is iteratively redrawing parts of the image, adjusting and refining the different parts towards the end goal. And the artist is moving in a kind of course defined manner. So initially sketching out the major parts and then adding detail to the parts. So each, each stroke action changes the image, but also maintains aspects of the image structure across the operation. You don't completely change the image after each operation. And the overall task is broken into simpler actions or steps. Right? We draw the bigger parts first, and then we add in the details. And we can think about how we might do this with generative AI. And I think there are al already some good examples. And one of the best ones, I think, is uh, the example of in-painting with text-to-image diffusion models. Um, so we start with an image, draw a purple mask over the part of it that we want to change, and specify a new prompt 
to get alternative imagery within that mask region. And so because the image is only changed within the mask, we maintain a lot of shared structure from step to step. And I think that's that's really great. Now, uh, ControlNet itself is also an example of uh, maintaining shared structure. So here in this top row, we provide an edge image as, uh, as a, a control image. And then we're able to, with the text prompt, control whether you get an uh, an external facade of the building from the outside, a view from the outside, versus an internal facade, a view from the inside of the building. But in particular, across all of these generations, large portions of the structure are maintained. So every pixel might be a different color, but somehow the underlying structure is still there. And similarly with poses, in this case, we have a control net for pose, for human poses, and um, we're able to generate uh, all kinds of different people, but all sharing essentially the same pose. And then the, the text prompt gives us a little bit more control over the look of the person. Um, so, so that's about maintaining shared structure. Another question uh, we have here, and, and one thing that I'm particularly, particularly excited about, is how we might use AI to break a task into simpler, smaller steps. And this is a place where techniques, uh, so-called neurosymbolic techniques, might really help. The idea here is that given a prompt, the AI black box could synthesize code, which is then executed to generate the final output. And you might ask, well, why, why do we want to go through this intermediary code that's output? Why not just generate the 3D model itself? And um, the advantage of this approach is that the output program is something that both humans and the AI model might be able to understand in similar ways. It may, be, it may be possible to formalize the semantics of the programming language in ways that allow for this kind of shared understanding between a human developer and the AI. And even without formal semantics, I think a human developer might be able to inspect the code and check that the code is somehow doing the right thing. And if the code fails, the developer could then go in and debug it. They wouldn't have to throw away the output. They could maybe modify the output to make it better. And so I think this approach is essentially about shifting the language of communicating with the AI from human natural language to some hybrid with a programming language. And one aspect of this approach that I think is particularly interesting is letting users define the code primitives and the grammar so that users can essentially choose the level of abstraction for the underlying code. And a big open research problem is how to define the primitives and the grammar. Now, so far this, uh, this pipeline is feed forward, but one thing that I think is also interesting is to let the human provide feedback on the code and then pass it back to the AI through this kind of backward arrow, either as an updated prompt or in a scheme that fine tunes the weights of the AI so that it learns how to generate better code. And I think uh, this, these are both promising approaches, but I'm especially interested in the, in the fine tuning approach. Now, one thing I'll mention is that chain of th thought methods are doing something similar for text question answering. Uh, but the output code in this case is a natural language step-by-step -step sequence for answering the question. An execution in this case involves running the AI LLM again, but with the original prompt and the step-by-step -step output uh, of the first step to generate the final output answer for in this case. And the cool thing about this is that humans can still inspect the output, the, the steps uh, or the code, which is great for interpretability and checking the answer. Uh, 
but the um but the system is uh but these kinds of systems currently are focused on automation so we currently don't have these kinds of back arrows that allow a human to fix the step-by-step -step output and feed it back to the AI and really fine tune the underlying weights. Um, and uh, this is hopefully coming in the future. Okay, so I just wanna end here with a few takeaways. Um, first, uh, uh, the, the main point I think of the first part of this talk is that when humans can, when, when human users cannot predict how input controls affect output results, the interface is terrible. It becomes a trial and error interface. And, um, and this is true of black box AIs. It's also true of humans if we're working with another human. And it'll always be true until we can develop ways to explain, to provide a predictive conceptual model explaining how to map the inputs to the outputs. Now, we've also discussed a few approaches to improving AI interfaces. I think allowing conversational turn taking to help establish common ground and repair mechanisms can help. Uh, we should think about how to deal with the ambiguity of natural language. And uh, we can think about code as an intermediate language to enable iterative refinement and incremental actions. And with that, I just want to thank the people that uh, helped me put this talk together. Uh, this, the people in bold here are students and postdocs that did some of the work that came from my lab that I showed you in this talk. Um, and finally, uh, I'd love to talk with all of you. Uh, if we don't get a chance to talk about your questions, please reach out. I'd, I'd love to uh, continue the conversation beyond this talk. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manish, for a wonderful talk. Um, let's, uh, let's virtually clap. And um, now we let's move on to the questions. So there is a bunch of questions and I see people have been asking and upvoting. Uh, please go ahead and continue with that. But uh, let's, uh, let's start, first start with the first question. Uh, the images generated of Manish don't uh, look like him. I wonder if individuals can feel more that the AI is stereotyping an Indian man. Also I wondered if AI couldn't just grab the picture from the web. Basically a human with AI could have done a better job, question mark. Yes, uh, yeah, so uh, the, the, the image the images generated by Dali don't look like me. <laughs> uh, and I didn't comment on it, uh, but uh, uh, that's absolutely right. I think people have developed methods that will allow you to feed these AIs example images. Dream Booth is one example that I showed later on. You could feed it example images of me and then have it produce new images of me or anyone else that would look like me. So work in that direction is coming and we can solve the problem of, of how to get a per, you know how to get uh, an image that looks like a particular person or a particular concept. Um, but uh, but I think what is really amazing is that these tools can, essentially produce these images with very, very little, right? They're producing these images with text and maybe a few images as input. Okay, um, kind of maybe a related question. Even searching on Google on other uh, search engines sometimes needs lots of prompts to get the correct answer. Mm -hmm. uh, pro problems have been there for a while, but now we're facing more with LLMs. Uh, can we learn something uh, from the research in the area to address here? Maybe I can add myself that um, it, it might also be that what we are dealing with this is kind of more, more akin to um, uh, you know, gardening than to uh, tool making. So maybe we should think more as uh, going to the nursery versus going to uh, a, a, a hardware store, right? That that 
you kind of you give those models some some water, some uh, some the right terms of soil, and then you kind of see what happens. Um, could it be that actually it's just a that we are kind of entering a different area of um, of, of of interaction? It's not kind of I told you what to do and you do it, but rather like I give you all the ingredients and then I see what happens, what grows up. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's great. So, um, you know, it, you made me think of like Zen gardening, right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so what we've really talked about in, and what I focused on in this talk has been trying to develop interfaces to directly do useful work. And that's typically how we think of designing software. We think of designing software often, at least in HCI, as trying to solve particular tasks and trying to be as efficient as we can be to solve those tasks for a for a human. And I, and I think a little bit what you're getting at, Alyosha, with the with the last part of the question is, well, maybe the tasks aren't really about efficiency or getting a specific result as a as an output and maybe they're much more about uh you know uh interacting to get a sense for what this other entity will do and produce right and to have a meaningful interaction in a different way than simply producing a particular output that you're interested in um okay okay um also kind of on, on that on that uh on that topic uh basically you know the the, the question is about uh oh wait i i'm i'm i is scrolling past too fast yes uh so the initial problem was you know conceptual models of we have four models of how ai works so how are we you know what what do we know now that we didn't know before? Is it is it and is it more of a uh, more of kind of humans needing to adapt, or is it a technological problem that 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 somehow you know the, these models need to be better at presenting a better conceptual model to us? Yeah, so um, that's a great question, right? I I think. The, the main point of the first part of the talk is that without a conceptual model, without this productive conceptual model, you end up resorting to trial and error. The second part of the talk is really about strategies we might use to push away from trial and error, right? And so some of the things that we can do is have these kinds of conversational interactions broadly defined where uh, we are working to establish a shared understanding of what certain things mean, right? I think thinking about how to do that is an open area of research that, that still needs to be looked into. Um, you know, it may also be that uh, researchers develop much better, higher level models of what the the black boxes are doing <laughs> right and if we're if, if we get those then i think we can also uh uh you know try to present those to users right now i think part of the problem is that even the researchers that are building these ai models they don't have a great uh you know causal model that will tell them how inputs will map onto outputs Mm -hmm. So the, um, right. one one of actually kind of a direct example of this, you know, are we are we getting better at this? So somebody asked you you showed examples with the Chat GPT uh, you know, three point five. Uh, have you tried the same prompts on GPT four and see if it gotten better? Yeah, I wanted to try them on GPT-4. Uh, unfortunately, I was too late to sign up for access. So uh, uh, it was terrible. But, um, you know, it might have gotten better, but we don't know. I think part of the issue is that we just don't know what it's doing. So we don't know if it if it solved the example that I showed, 
we don't know how much that would carry over to other examples. And that's really the underlying problem. We see lots of really fantastic examples of what these things can produce, but we don't see any of that sort of dark matter, for, for lack of a better word, of examples that went haywire and produced, you know, essentially junk. Uh, and, um, and I think that, um, you know, uh, I, I think the other part of this question is about whether people can learn from interacting with the models to build a kind of predictive model. And I think to some extent you can, uh, people are very adaptable, but they come up with lots of folk theories. So I showed you the prompt for the Spider-Man example, and it had lots and lots of things in there that the community of AI artists has sort of suggested are words that will help produce better results. So it had the names of various artists, the system didn't, the, the example didn't actually produce an image in any one of their styles, but people still put in those names because they've heard that putting in those names produces higher quality results. And so it's very easy for people to have these kinds of folk theories uh, that may or may not be helping with the prediction. Okay, okay. Uh Thank you so much. I'm afraid we ran out of time today. I'd like to thank Manish again for his informative presentation and, and insightful answers for many of the questions. And special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate today. This talk was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org. You can find uh, announcements of, of upcoming talks and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. Also, please fill out a quick survey when you can suggest future topics or speakers, which you can, uh, which we should see on your screen in a moment. On behalf of ACM, Manisha Gravala and myself, Alexei Efres, thank you again for joining, and I hope you will join us again in the future. And this concludes the talk.